this is Anne Barnhart again, and because there is so little evidence surrounding um, the Burgolian anti-papacy and the um, invalidity of Pope Benedict's attempted partial resignation in February of 2013, after the part one video lecture that I put out last November of 2018, that was two hours and 15 minutes long, um, it's become clear that I have to do another part two video to lay out the additional um, evidence and so forth that has come to light just in the past seven months or so since the first video came out. So here we are again for the part two video and I'm going to try to keep this under three hours and I wish that I, that was an exaggeration. But uh, here we are, let's get right into it. I am not going to rehash much at all from the first video. Um, please, if you, if you are interested in this topic, watch the part one video first, then follow up with this one. But uh, having said that, I do hope that this video will also be, have a standalone capacity so that someone being exposed to, the idea, to these ideas for the first time can watch this part two video and not be completely lost. I've tried to structure it that way. So let's dive into it. The Bergoglian anti-papacy, the Freemasonic Teutonic final attack on the Petrine Sea. And that is indeed what it is. They are going down this time. This, this Freemasonic, Satanic, and a lot of it rooted in the German Theological Academy. They've been driving at this for a hundred years and they are going to meet their end. They are not gonna be allowed to succeed in this plan. This is part two. We are recording this um, in the early, early morning hours of June 16th, 2019. Like I said, please also watch part one, recorded in November of 2018. Acknowledgements quickly first. Uh, Mr. Mark Doherty of the non Vinny Pachin blog, who has done just absolutely outstanding work and is actually the person who discovered and sourced quite a few of the evidentiary um, materials that we're gonna go through in this video. So shout out to Mr. Doherty. Thank you so much for all of your work and support. Um, the Germans, you know who you are. Um, my, my website readers in Germany who have been tremendous help in pouring over the German academic texts that we discovered, and you'll see how we came to that discovery. Um, they've been absolutely invaluable and, and have lent some incredible insights into into the Ger into the German Academy itself. So thank you guys. God bless, uh, Mr. Videographer. Again, thank you, Mr. Videographer. Again, my friend Phil for letting me use his place. And as always, all of my supporters, all of your prayers, all of your your kindness, your kind notes, your words of support, and to be honest, yes, also your your financial contributions. Thank you so much. God bless you. We're keeping up the fight. All right, the answer to this entire question of the Bergolian anti-papacy, the validity of Pope Benedict's attempted partial abdication in February of 2013, this whole situation, okay? The answer to this lies in canon law. The papacy is a juridical office. Um, the attempted partial abdication of Pope Benedict in 2013 is a juridical act. Therefore, where should we be looking for the truth? What should we be focused on? Should we be focused on the um, unapproved, visionary, mystical experiences of postmenopausal Italian women in the latter half of the 20th century to figure out what's going on here? No, we should not. Where we need to be looking for the answers and for the truth, and ultimately because the truth is our Lord, we need to be looking in this case, obviously, at canon law. So a lot of this presentation, in fact, the entire first half, is going to revolve completely around canon law. So in this case, what we're dealing with in terms of canon law is the 1983 code. Now I can hear already the weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, rending of garments. Oh, the 83 code, the 83 code. Look folks, the divine providence has set it up such that the law that we are under and that the church is under right now is the 83 code. 
I'm not going to debate about you know, whether or not the 83 code is, is the most perfected form of, of a code of canon law, it, it isn't. I, I concede the fact, but folks, it's what we're under. And the divine providence has seen to it that we are under the 83 code. And so that's what we have to look to. And lo and behold, what do we discover? The 83 code covers everything that's going on in this situation and covers it quite clearly. Wow, it's almost as if the divine providence knows what he's doing or something. So 83 code is, is what we'll be using and because it's what we're under. This is about the only recapitulation from the part one video that, that we're going to do. And just very briefly, we're gonna start with Canon 188. A resignation made out of grave fear that is inflicted unjustly or out of malice substantial error or simony is invalid by the law itself. Hone in on those words, invalid by the law itself, not invalid because the College of Cardinals says so, not invalid for any, any other reason. It's invalid by the law itself. And we can see, I put the Latin text on the presentations just so that you can see it and just so that you know that it's there. And yes, ultimately, canonically, the Latin is the authoritative version of the text and, and there it is. Canon 188, what is the legal definition of substantial error? Um, over the past couple years as I've been working on this and um, since the, the part one video came out last November, I've received a lot of questions from people saying, well, Ann, what, what, what does substantial error even mean? First of all, I'll remind you the common sense meaning of the words, the plain sense of the words is, is meaningful. I mean, don't, don't kid yourself and don't allow yourself to be, to be tricked or deluded by people who tell you that, that just mere lay people cannot, cannot understand the law, of course you can. But if you want to delve in to what exactly this term substantial error means, I got you covered. Here's the definition. Substantial error is ignorance or misjudgment about the essential nature, main terms, or principal motive of the object of an act. Okay, so let's delve into that with regards to what Pope Benedict attempted to do in 2013. Pope Benedict's failed attempted partial abdication of February 2013 violates all three terms of this definition. The essential object of the act of resignation of the papacy is the renunciation of the office. In Latin, that word is munus, M-U-N-U-S. This is explicitly laid down in Canon 332.2, which we'll get into more detail on in just a few minutes. And it's simply confirming common sense. If you're going to resign from something, you have to resign from the whole kit and caboodle. If Nixon, for example, when he resigned, if he had only resigned being commander in chief, that would have been an invalid resignation. It would have been a substantially erroneous um, attempted resignation. It wouldn't have been valid. If you're gonna resign the presidency or any office, you have to resign the whole thing. You have to resign the office, the state of being the Pope, the president, the King of England, whatever it is, not just an aspect of it, not just one activity that derives from the office. You have to, you have to resign the whole thing. Canon 332.2, as we will see, makes this very clear and it also confirms to common sense. An office is a state of being. There's a huge movement out there, I, I, a, attempting, I guess, to rebut me, um, saying that the terms office, ministry, these are completely interchangeable. The law sees no distinction between these two terms. That is abject nonsense. That is abject nonsense. An office is a state of being. In order to resign the papacy, you have to renounce being the Pope. 
That is holding the office. Ministry, in Latin ministerium, refers to things that the Pope may or may not elect to do or be able to do as a result of being the Pope, such as teaching, governing, presiding. A ministerium is derivative of the munus. The ministry is derivative of the office. The office is the state of being. The ministries are the things that you do because you hold the office. Ministries are optional contingent activities of the ontological state of being the holder of the Petrine office. We're talking about two completely different categories. There's no way that these terms are synonymous. They're not synonymous in simple conversation. How could they possibly, possibly be synonymous in the law? That's nonsense. These two main terms, office and ministry, belong to, to completely different categories, being office and doing ministry, and thus cannot now nor ever be argued to be synonymous in English or any other language, and we will see that they are not. Joseph Ratzinger is the Pope. Notice the verb to be. George Washington was the first president of the United States. Note the verb to be. When Queen Elizabeth dies, Prince Charles will be the King of England. Note the verb to be. Now, look at this. The Pope governs, teaches, and legislates. The Pope. So we've presupposed the office. We've presupposed the state of being. Now we're talking about the things that the Pope does. Govern, teach, legislate. The, the President of the United States commands the military and enforces the law. Again, we're presupposing, because we've said the President of the United States, we're presupposing the office, and now we're talking about something different, the things that the, the President does in his administration, command the military, enforce the law. The Queen of England presides over Parliament. We presuppose that she is the Queen, and now we're talking about what she does derivative from that. So you can clearly see, just common sense tells you, these are two completely different categories. When Pope John Paul II was in an induced coma after being shot, he did not lose the Petrine office. Even if he had stayed in a coma for a prolonged period of time, he would have retained the Petrine office. He would have still been the Pope even though he was incapable of executing the Petrine ministry in any way because he was in a coma. Exactly the same thing when Reagan was shot. When President Reagan was shot and in a coma, he retained the office. He was still the president of the United States and Vice President Bush remained the vice president. When, when Reagan was on the operating table and in an induced coma, Vice President Bush, even though he was, he was the temporary chief executive pro tem while Reagan was incapacitated, no one was calling Vice President Bush Mr. President because he wasn't the president. He was just the vice president. Reagan still retained the office even though he was in a coma. So we see the, the, the very clear and easy to understand distinction here. Now, here's, here's a new little piece of canon law that, again, Mr. Mr. Doherty st stumbled on this and sent it to me, and this is, this is a huge one. Canon 131.1. The ordinary power of governance is that which is joined to a certain office by the law itself, semicolon. Delegated that which is granted to a person, but not by means of an office. And again, here's the Latin down at the bottom. And notice that in, in this canon, the Latin is not the word munus, M-U-N-U-S. It's the, it's the English word that, or the English cognate that we readily recognize, officio. 
It's there, clear, clear as day, officio. So let's go back to Pope Benedict's final, <laughs> for now, but it might not be, papal audience of 27 February 2013. This is the famous, the always is also a forever paragraph. Okay, here we go. The always is also a forever. There can no longer be a return to the private sphere. My decision to resign the active exercise of the ministry does not revoke this. I do not return to private life, to a life of travel, meetings, receptions, conferences, and so on. I am not abandoning the cross, but remaining, remaining. How much clearer can you be in a new way at the side of the crucified Lord? I no longer bear the power of the office qualified for the governance of the church, but in the service of prayer, I remain, again, there's that word, remain, so to speak, in the enclosure of St. Peter. St. Benedict, whose name I bear, not I bore, but I bear as Pope, and he still does. We talked about this in the part one. It, it speaks to the visibility. He's still, Your Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI. He still signs documents. Pope Benedict, or he signs documents Benedict XVI. He still gives my apostolic blessing. St. Benedict, whose name I bear as Pope, will be a great example for me in this. He showed us the way for a life which, whether active or passive, is completely given over to the work of God. All right, so what, what, what are we realizing here? What Pope Benedict was, was actually trying to do was to set up effectively what would legally be called a regency. He was trying to delegate the administrative aspect of, of the papacy to another man. Call a conclave, elect, elect my successor, but really what would he be first? He would be my regent. Elect my regent, who I will delegate the administrative functions of the papacy to, and then when I, when I die, let's just say he'll, he will grandfather in as my successor. Legally, that's, that's what you realize is going on here. Now, 131 speaks to this. Let's go back to it. The ordinary power of governance is that which is joined to a certain office by the law itself. Delegated that which is granted to a person, but not by means of an office. So the Pope can do this. The Pope can, if he wants to, he can, he can designate, he can delegate and, and dispense out responsibilities, which would not be outside of the realm of just common sense and expectation as a, as a Pope, you know, gets to be over 90 years old, let's say. Well, you can see, you could see a Pope potentially doing something like that. But what does the canon right here say? That doesn't transfer the office. That doesn't transfer the office. Attempting to establish a de facto regency does not confer nor transfer the office to the regent or to any delegate. Delegating administrative governance power is not renouncing the office. It is exactly the opposite. Only one who holds and retains an office can delegate by definition. Isn't that interesting? So now we have this canon 131 informing us about, well, if he's trying to just lay off the administrative aspect of it, what does canon law say about that? What does the 1983 code say about that? And it's clear, it's clear as day. Well, you, you can delegate all you want, but that doesn't transfer an office. Delegation does not transfer an office in any way. And of course, there's no such thing as splitting the Petrine office. That's madness. Pope Benedict's principal motive in proffering his invalid attempted partial abdication of only the active Petrine ministry for the governance of the church seems to have been long discussed and longed for by 20th century Teutonic theologians. And in case you, you don't know, Teutonic means German. Um, so we're, you're going to see that word a lot. 
20th century Teutonic theologians, as well as Freemasons looking to destroy the Catholic Church by dissolving the Petrine office, which is the last remaining absolute monarchy, into dissolve the papacy, dissolve the Petrine office into a collegial synodal shared ministry. Tell me that's not exactly what they're trying to trick in everyone into believing that they're doing. With all of this talk of synodality and all of this talk of, of decentralizing, spinning things out to bishops' conferences, we're getting ready to have this, this Amazon Synod where they're going to go for um, the abolition of priestly, priestly celibacy. And there was even talk a few months ago, they, they want to um, give the, the Indians in, in Bolivia and South America the ability to make to make Eucharistic hosts out of out of yucca, out of a, a, a tuber that grows in the ground. That would invalidate, by the way, that would completely invalidate the Eucharist. Um, they just keep pounding and pounding and pounding on this. And you realize, you look at this, and you realize it's all of a piece. They've been talking about it for decades, if not a hundred years. This is how they want to get the papacy. You don't just go after it. You don't just try to abolish it. And there were German theologians, and we'll get into this, who actively did want to just straight up abolish the papacy. No, 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 no. You got to be more subtle than that, you see. You have to dissolve it such that the people out there are still convinced that, yeah, everything's fine. We're just, we're just spinning it off. And so instead of having you know, just one pope who's an absolute monarch, well, we're going to have a collegial synodal, there might be multiple popes at the same time, and then whoever is the administrative pope, he might have a council of nine cardinals, basically a shadow government, and then we're going to spin everything out and we're going to let the German bishops' conferences do what they want. So when you cross the border from Germany into Poland, if you're in Germany, let's say, for example, they, they decide that sodomy is no longer a sin. In Germany, sodomy won't be a sin, but when you cross the border into Poland, it will be. And things like that. This is the, the satanic, Freemasonic, Teutonic attack on the papacy. Since the Petrine office established by Jesus Christ himself cannot be fundamentally transformed, nor expanded, nor can the Petrine office be transferred by delegation, the principal motive of the object of the act was defective. That is substantially erroneous. And so that's how we get back to Canon 188. The, um, the principal motive of the object of the act was defective. No question. The project of the Freemasons acting through the Teutonic theological schools of the 20th century has been the dissolution of the papacy along the munus ministerium distinction, along the office ministry distinction. They've been writing about it. We're going to get into it here in a few minutes. They, they've been explicit about this. The only thing is that nobody will read it, and we didn't discover it until we came across a text that was written in English that brought all of these concepts together. Once we had that, okay, now we're off and running because most of this stuff was written initially in German because this is all a function of the Teutonic Academy. Here is, um, here's the money quote from Pope Benedict's invalid partial attempted abdication in the Latin, in the Latin. Um, Qua propter bene, conscius ponderis, huius actus plena libertate with full freedom, declaro, I declare, me ministerio. If you want, if you want somebody, kid, there's a, there's a, a person out there on the internet who keeps saying that if you're gonna, if you're gonna make an argument about this, you need to be able to make it in five seconds or in 140 characters in one single tweet. Okay, here it is. He didn't resign the office. There it is. He, he resigned the active ministry. And there's the word right there. He didn't resign the office. Canon law says you have to resign the office. Here's Canon 332.2. If it happens that the Roman pontiff resigns his office, it is required for validity that the resignation is made freely and properly manifested 
but not that it is accepted by anyone. Oh, Canon 332.2 is just a ferocious little bodyguard. 332.2 is the bodyguard that is defending Canon 188 and defending the papacy itself because Canon 332.2 specifically is addressing papal resignations. So first of all, it says he has to resign his office. He can't resign just a ministry and partially retain his office. He has to resign the office. He has to resign being the Pope. You cannot seriously argue that Pope Benedict XVI consciously choosing to continue to wear the papal white, consciously choosing to continue to be called by his papal name in the papal style, your holiness, his holiness, freely choosing to live inside the Vatican, doing everything exactly opposite, exactly contrary to all previous precedent with Celestine V being the most prominent. He's He's done everything exactly the opposite of what you would expect of a person who resigned being the Pope. That, that can't even be argued in, by any serious person anymore. So we've got that, um, that it, it, it can't be coerced. The, the resignation has to be made freely. That's really tough to prove. There's a whole mountain of circumstantial evidence about that. Um, but I think that's such, that's such a rabbit hole that's so difficult to prove that we should probably leave the coercion thing just to the side. And, and that's something that we will let history bear out. Um, properly manifested. You got to do it right. You got to do it right. And, but this, this final clause, this is just so beautiful, but not that it is accepted by anyone. Doesn't matter what the College of Cardinals say. It doesn't matter what the, the, the church, the people, the media, it does not matter what any of them think about it. The only, the only person who is adjudicating this is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself because he is who is standing behind the Code of Canon Law. He's, Christ has, has grafted himself as promised that he has welded himself to Holy Mother Church and her laws. And so it is Christ that is, is, that is the backstop of all of this and is guaranteeing all this. So it's, it's canon law that judges whether or not um, a papal attempted resignation is in fact valid or not. It has nothing to do with anyone else, including the College of Cardinals. Here it is in the, um, here's 332.2 in the Latin. You'll notice the word um, is muneri because as we know maybe a little bit about Latin, when you, um, there are various forms of, of nouns depending upon what grammatical function they are serving in the sentence. And in this case, muneri is the dative singular case of munus. So there you go, there, that's it. Non solo propter was mistranslated from the Latin into Italian by the Vatican. This is not surprising at all. Um, so Pope Benedict's um, statement that he made on February 11 in Latin, you have to understand that Italian is the language of the Vatican today. There are only a handful of people left in the Vatican who are fluent in Latin, who are Latinists. It used to be that everyone was fluent in Latin, that that was the language that everything was done in, that everybody could speak. Oh, not anymore. There's just a handful of people left who can actually speak Latin. So the functional language of the Vatican is Italian. So what happens? Pope Benedict reads this statement, drafts and reads this statement. That statement in the original Latin is then translated by an Italian Latinus into Italian. That translation into Italian erroneously mistranslated munus into ministerio in Italian instead of ufficio. It should have been the Italian word ufficio, but it wasn't. It was mistranslated as ministerio. So then it's translated from Latin into the, the main functional language of the Vatican Italian 
from that, from that Italian, which has these airs in it, that is what gets translated into English, French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, Chinese, whatever. And so these mistranslation errors were in it from almost the very beginning. All subsequent translations were then made using the erroneous Italian version. Pope Benedict in non solum propter did not resign the munus, the office, the state of being the Pope per canon 332.2, but only the ministerio, the active ministry for the governance of the church as he made clear himself. The sole arbiter of the validity of a papal resignation is the law itself. Christ specifically stated that when he binds himself to church law, when he said to Peter in Matthew 16, 19, and I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. It goes both ways. What Christ is doing is he is he's binding himself to church law so that there isn't chaos and so that he's there and he's backing the whole thing. So we don't look to the College of Cardinals here. We look to the law, and in looking to the law, we're looking to Christ ultimately. And this is an image of our Lord uh, teaching in the temple. And this, this whole concept, just every time I think about it, it's the fifth joyful mystery of the rosary, finding our Lord in the temple. He's teaching in the temple. Our Lady and St. Joseph have lost him on the road. They realize he's gone. They run back, and they say to him, what we, where were you? We lost you. And he, and he says, where did you think I would be? Where did you think I would be? Didn't you know I would be about my father's business? And what the fifth joyful mystery of the rosary is challenging us to do is, is to look for our Lord and to find our Lord. But you got to look for him in the right place in the right context in all of this. So we're not going to look at, you know, mystical visions of, of women or anything like that. We're not going to look to the College of Cardinals because the law clearly says don't do that. If you've got a juridical problem and a juridical question, where do you look for our Lord in the law? So there it is, but not that it is accepted by anyone. This clause completely protects the papacy from the mob and perhaps more specifically from the College of Cardinals itself and as we have in this case from the Pope himself, should he be in substantial error. Pope Benedict is in substantial error. Don't forget that, okay? A lot of people seem to want to ascribe this as being some big, big elaborate plan that he's, that he's executing. No, the only person who is, who is executing a big elaborate master plan here is the divine providence. Don't assign to Pope Benedict something that really doesn't belong to him. He's in substantial error. Let's be realistic about this. Does it make any sense to you that there would be these laws written about the validity of a papal resignation, but as long as a sufficient percentage of the College of Cardinals or the people in general accepted an illegal, invalid resignation, then meh, it's all good. Does that make any sense at all? Does that sound right? As long as everyone goes along with it. Meh. Is Prince Harry married to, uh, what's her name? Meghan Markle, who is actually Mrs. Trevor Engelson? The entire planet says that they're married. Does that make them married? I don't see how, since she's married to a Jewish guy from California. But, uh, but everybody says they're married. Is that the standard? Are we going to fall for that? Are we going to fall for that? No. If so, that would mean that the mob, either in the sense of the College of Cardinals or in the sense of the people themselves, could will a pope's deposition and the illegal installation of another man as pope as long as most people go along with it. Again, does that sound right to you? Does that make any logical sense? Does that make any moral sense? Really? No. The will of the mob would trump the natural and divine law in that case. And a coerced resignation, for example, would be validated by universal, universal and peaceful acceptance. 
or a pope being bought off, simony, would be hunky-dory as long as everyone went along with it. And as we are living right now, and many people are arguing, a papal resignation made in substantial air would be totally fine and dandy as long as everyone is cool with it, including the very pope who was himself in substantial air, and a canonically invalid conclave would be sanated and validated by nothing more than the will of the mob. This is madness. This is chaos. It is of the liar. It is of the enemy. It is of the devil. No way. No, sir. Little, little visual, visual aid here but not that it is accepted by anyone. Meridiaga, sodomite arch-criminal, arch-criminal. They, they had to pull him off of an airplane because there was a mob of people ready to lynch the guy in Honduras because he's that much of a, of a sodo-criminal. Walter Casper, Grand Luther Mason, Grand Luther Mason, Walter Casper. Oh, as long as, as long as he's okay with it. Uh, there's Pietro Parolin. Bad, bad man. Bad dude. Very bad. Oh, as, as long as he's okay with it, then it's fine. And finally, oh, there's Coco Palmario. There's Cardinal Coco Palmario, who was caught presiding over a cocaine-fueled orgy that was probably a black mass in the palace of the holy office. As long as they're cool with it, even though the law says they don't matter, as long as they're all cool with it, meh, meh. There are people even arguing that if they're cool with it is dogmatic infallibility. If they, if they accept Pope Benedict's resignation of February of 2013 and they call this conclave and they accept the results of this, this resulting conclave and they're okay with it, then it is, it is a dogmatic, infallibly certain, take it to the bank. Forget the natural law, forget the divine law, but certainly forget canon law. These guys... These guys, the will of this mob would trump all of it. Does that make any sense to you? It shouldn't. It should make you sick. The very proposition should make you sick because it's wrong. It's false. It's a lie. To argue that universal peaceful acceptance of an illegal papal resignation by the College of Cardinals sanates that resignation is to make an idol, an idol of the College of Cardinals, putting them over and above natural, divine, and canon law, and directly implies that the papacy is bestowed upon a man by the cardinals or even the church and not directly by Christ. Oh, that's a massive error too. This is in direct contradiction to Pastor Eternus, the um, document of Pope Pius IX issued in 1870. Quote, at open variance with this clear doctrine of Holy Scripture, as it has ever been understood by the Catholic Church, are the perverse opinions of those who, while they distort the form of government established by Christ the Lord in his church, deny that Peter, in his single person, preferably to all the other apostles, whether taken separately or together, was endowed by Christ with a true and proper primacy of jurisdiction, or of those who assert that the same primacy was not bestowed immediately and directly upon blessed Peter himself, but upon the church and through the church on Peter as her minister. Mm -mm. If anyone therefore shall say that blessed Peter the apostle was not appointed the prince of all the apostles and the visible head of the whole church militant, or that the same directly and immediately received from the same our Lord Jesus Christ a primacy of honor only and not of true and proper jurisdiction, let him be anathema. Praise God. Pius IX. Can the Pope break the natural law? Because that's what we're talking about here. 
can, can the Pope declare that any positive integer greater than one is equal to one? Because that's basically what we're talking about here. Is two equal to one? Well, there's only one Pope, but there's two. And maybe at some point, if they, if they get uh, Bergoglio to resign, maybe then there will be three. Can the Pope declare that any positive integer greater than one is equal to one? Not, I'm not being facetious, I'm not exaggerating, because that's what we're talking about here. Can the Pope break the laws of arithmetic, the natural law? Can the Pope break the divine law? Can the seventh commandment be abrogated and the papacy be stolen, stolen, as long as the Pope and the College of Cardinals all go along with it? Nope. Oh, here's a question for you. Does error have rights? Did something change? Did something change in 2013 and we just didn't get the memo? Because um, before that, everybody was in agreement that error had no rights. Rights are a claim given by God. Is God, who is himself truth, now giving claim to falsity? Because that's, that's what you'd have to argue here. Does the Pope serve at the pleasure of the College of Cardinals, subject to a no-confidence vote and deposition at any time? Because again, that is what you're arguing here, if you're arguing this universal peaceful acceptance argument. It is contrary to canon law and it's contrary to just common sense. No. And it sets up, you know, papalatry. Papalatry, that's, that's old and busted. The new hotness now is cardinalatry, apparently. Now, now we have to worship the cardinals? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The universal peaceful acceptance argument leads instantly to an Islamic, an Islamic chaos, wherein God is pure will, devoid of rationality, the law is utterly meaningless, objective truth is shifting and unknowable, and the understanding of the stability of reality itself is attacked. That is, Ontological realities can be changed in retrospect, and something can both be and not be, depending on one's position in time. This is nothing less than a full frontal assault on the law of non-contradiction. And if you ask me, this pump was primed by cookie-cutter marriage annulments. Because most Catholics running around today have gone and gotten their cookie cutter Catholic divorce annulment. And they honestly believe that they used to be married. They were married. And then the church issued a decree that says, no, we're going to change that. You were married, but now we're going to say you weren't married. And people's brains are scrambled and they can't think this through. It's not what an annulment is. An annulment is saying that you were never, ever married, period. The whole thing was a mistake. Not that you were married and then you ceased to be married, like civil divorce says. No, no, no. But see, these cookie-cutter annulments, everybody in their minds, almost everyone in their minds, thinks that that's what it means. That the ontological, re that the church issues a statement and the ontological log reality changes in retrospect. Absolutely not. Look. With regards to the papacy, Bergoglio is either the Pope or he isn't, period. Either he is or he isn't. There's no changing that. There's no calling some ecumenical council in the year 2100 and that ecumenical council issuing an edict that then in retrospect reaches back through the timeline and changes the ontological reality. So for those of us right here, right now in 2019, Bergoglio is the Pope, but at some point in the future, some ecumenical council might say, well, no, he wasn't. And so for everyone from that point forward, Bergoglio wasn't the Pope, but for all of us right here, right now, he is. Something cannot both be and not be. This is the first 90 seconds of the first day of Metaphysics 101. This is not difficult. This is not difficult.
It is a full-fledged attack on reality itself. And I also, another thing I blame in addition to cookie cutter and almonds, believe it or not, I think another reason why people can't think this through and are so comfortable with this idea of, of reality changing in retrospect in the timeline is science fiction. You watch Star Trek, any, any science fiction thing, and one of the main plot devices is time travel and changing the timeline in the past. And I think people are just completely comfortable um, intellectually now with this insanity. And that's what it is. It's insanity. And if you if you didn't if you can't think it through that way, let's go let's go to the glory the glory of Pachi. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. What is this a testimony to? It's a testimony to the stability of reality. It's a testimony to the stability of the timeline. Ontological realities do not change depending on where you are in the timeline. This is only the most common prayer ever. Well, I mean, if you pray the rosary, you say you, you say the Hail Mary more than the, the Gloria Patri, but I mean, come on. Protestants say this. Everybody knows this. Have you ever thought about what those words mean? As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Reality is stable. The timeline is stable. Now, let's go to Canon 359. Oh, when the apostolic see is vacant, the College of Cardinals possess only that power in the church which is attributed to it in special law. And here is the Latin. It's the first clause, y'all. It's all about the first clause in Canon 359. When the apostolic see is vacant. The College of Cardinals has no authority, capacity, ability to call a conclave if the see is not vacant. The College of Cardinals has zero authority or capability to call a conclave if the see is occupied no matter what, no matter what the circumstances, period, full stop. No vacant see, no valid conclave. Bam! Right there in canon law, right there in the 83 code. Praise God. Have any canonists commented or objected to any of this? Yes, Sandra Magister published on this in September of 2014. There were Italian canonists screaming from the rooftops in February of 2013. So Pope Benedict announces his intention on the 11th with an effective date of 8 p.m. on the 28th of February. In that interstitial time period, there were Italian canonists jumping up and down and saying, no, 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 this is, this is all wrong. This is bad. And then after that, there were more that jumped in. They jumped in specifically because Pope Benedict started referring to himself as Pope Emeritus because we didn't know in February what he was going to do, where he was going to go, how this was going to play out. He starts calling himself Pope Emeritus and more canonists jump on and say, no way, absolutely not. This is impossible. Um, just for the sake of brevity, we'll put the links in the show notes. It'll be available to everyone, but I'm not going to go through and read it. I mean, Magister's piece alone is 3,500 words. Who are these canonists? Just so you know, I'm not making this up. Manuel Jesus Aroba, a professor of canon law at the Pontifical Lateran University leading light of canon law and former rector of the Pontifical Gregorian University, the Jesuit Gianfranco Ghirlanda, Valerio Giliotti, professor of the history of European law at the University of Turin, and Father Stefano Violi, professor of law at the theological fac faculty of Emilia Romagna, which is the state in Italy, I think, where Bologna is. Um, so here you've got four canonists you know, Pontifical Lateran University, the Greg, um, University of Turin, who are jumping up and down. It's not just unlettered laywomen like me jumping up and down and saying this. There are absolutely canonists, but nobody will, no one will talk about this. 
The Sochi book did just recently come out in English, and I think that in the Sochi book that these canonists are cited, and I think there are other canonists also cited in addition to these guys. So yes, there are canonists who have been objecting to this from the very, very beginning. Did this whole partial abdication and expanded Petrine ministry air just come out of left field? No, this stew has been simmering for decades. Let me introduce you to the Miller dissertation. Could you hand me a copy of the Miller dissertation, please? Excuse me. Why, thank you. Here it is. 300 pages of agonizing over exactly all of this, what's going on, exactly what we're talking about. It is called The Divine Right of the Papacy in Recent Ecumenical Theology. And this was technically found, again, as we were plowing through documents and footnotes and this and that, Mark Doherty of the non Vinnie Pachin blog stumbles onto this, sends me this link. I buy the electronic version for 10 bucks immediately and was up all night reading this thing. It is, it is absolutely incredible. It is a Rosetta Stone. It is talking in detail about this whole question and what we're dealing with. So there it is. That is J. Michael Miller, and there's a picture of the Rosetta Stone. Um, a word about Miller and this dissertation. It's, we're not, we're not, talking about J. Michael Miller, the man himself. And right now, Miller is the Archbishop of Vancouver, Canada. He's American, but he's currently posted as the Bishop of Vancouver. Um, this is his doctoral dissertation that he wrote in 1978. He presented it in 79, and it was published by the Greg because they thought so much of it in 1980. So this is just his doctoral dissertation. And if you're not familiar with these sorts of doctoral dissertations, what they mostly are, there's not a lot of speculative thought on Miller's part in here. Why, why this has such intense value is because it is a collection and a synthesis of um, the, the Teutonic, the German theological academies thoughts, fantasies, desires about what they wanted to do to fundamentally transform the papacy and why it's so incredibly valuable to us is because it's written in English. All of this stuff is coming out of Germany. The vast majority of this stuff is written in German. And for someone like me, I mean, German might as well be Mandarin Chinese, and that's not much of an exaggeration. Um, I don't even know what keywords to look for if I were looking at a German text. I can't make heads or tails of it. I can with Italian. You can pick up, pick out lots of cognates out of Italian and you can look for keywords. German, lost. It's, it's scribbles on a page, baby. So this thing, written by an American in English, it's a Rosetta Stone. And it's not, we're not looking for the speculative thought of J. Michael Miller. That's not what this is about. This thing is gold because of the citations, the bibliography, the footnotes. Oh my gosh, the index on this thing. You just turn to the back, look at the index, look at the names. Who is the most, who do you think is the most heavily cited person in this text? Walter Casper. Casper and Rahner. And then Ratzinger, there's a huge Ratzinger citation section, and Ratzinger edited half, half of the footnotes in this text. So, moving on. The Miller dissertation is a synthesis and compendium of the Teutonic Theological Academy's intense, agonized, detailed discussions of the papacy and the need to fundamentally transform it in order to appease schismatics Lutherans and Anglicans in particular, entire chapters dedicated to Lutherans and Anglicans and how, how, do, we, how do we change the papacy so that they're okay with it? Um, you, you don't, they're the, they're the heretics, they're the schismatics. Doesn't even occur to these people, doesn't even occur to these people. And to make the papacy relevant, congruent with, and acceptable to the modern democratized world, it is taken for granted that the papacy, qua absolute monarchy, is an expired paradigm. 
That's just assumed in this text. 300 pages. And this was, this went over really well because the Greg published it and it's written by an American in English. It's 10 bucks online. The link is all over my website, but we'll of course put it in the video show notes. Um, so you can go and buy it for yourself. It's 10 bucks for the e-version. Why not? Why not? The Miller dissertation contains little speculative thought by Miller himself, its values and its compilation of sources and quotations and in its bibliography and footnotes. The Miller dissertation is 300 pages of agonizing over the following terms and distinctions by the Teutonic Theological Academy of the mid 20th century. Eustavinum versus Eus Humanum. So created by divine right or created by human, by human right. Irreversible versus reversible papacy. What does that mean? Can the papacy be abolished? That's what that means. And yes, there were plenty of them that were arguing that yes, the papacy can be abolished and should be abolished. Hans Kuhn, Johannes Neumann, both of those guys were at Tübingen at the same time as Ratzinger. They're, they're stridently arguing that the papacy needs to just be abolished. So that's what irreversible and reversible, that's what that means. Immutable, immutable versus mutable. Is it changeable? Is the papacy changeable? Pretty much all of them across the board say, yes, it is. Not only is it changeable, but it must be changed. And some of them argue that it must be changed radically. Um, hello? <laughs> What do you think's been going, what do you think they've been, been attempting to do, but they will fail? What do you think they've been attempting to do for the past six years? Fundamental transformation of the papacy, but it's not going to work. Petrine office versus Petrine ministry or function. Agonizing, absolutely agonizing over the distinction between the two terms, which just goes to show you that the whole argument that, well, it doesn't matter legally whether Pope Benedict said in non solum propter that he, if, if he resigned the office or the ministry, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. These words are not synonyms. We got 300 pages. And then this is just, this is just the starting point. This is just the beginning. Then you've got all the footnotes coming off of this. You've got all of the, the bibliography coming off of this. This is just the beginning. So who are the key players? On the far left, you have the abolitionists. Like I said, that's Hans Kuhn. That's Johannes Neumann. Neumann was a layman canonist. Um, he left the church in, I think, I want to say the late 70s. He completely apostatized became a, wait for it, humanist. And what is humanist code for? Freemason. And died, I believe, in 2013 as an apostate humanist Freemason. Huh, how about that? Center left moderate. Let's call these guys transformationalists and uh, purveyors of the dissolution hypothesis or the hypothesis of, of dissolution dissolve the Petrine office in favor of a, an expanded, transformed Petrine ministry or function. That would be Carl Rahner, who is Ratzinger's, who is Ratzinger's um, mentor, um, and who's the biggest proponent of this, Walter Casper. This has been Walter Casper's life project. This is his life's project, destroying the papacy. And we'll get into why and what his motives are in a moment. To the right, the far right even, <laughs> talk about an Overton window here, my friends. On the right to far right is Joseph Ratzinger. Um, Ratzinger, as, as he aged, as he got older, moved further and further and further to the right. Before the council, at the council, he was what we would all agree was liberal. And then as he aged and as he saw the results of the council and the Novus Ordo and everything, he kept moving further and further and further to the right. So he's moving in that direction. However, why this is important, he's fighting it out with these guys at Tübingen. 
Um, he's fighting with Casper. He has a falling out with Rahner when he moved sufficiently far to the right that Ra he and Rahner were not no longer seeing eye to eye anymore. Um, and But what's also most important and what you'll see from this text is that Ratzinger was editing most of what these guys were writing in their academic journals and so forth. They're all reading each other's stuff. They're all debating this. They're all fighting this out. So why this is important is this whole, this whole notion that, well, you know, there was Pope Benedict had absolutely no previous thought about bifurcating the papacy or anything like that. No way. He, Ratzinger, has been involved in this Teutonic debate about fundamentally transforming the papacy for 50, 55 years at minimum, at absolute minimum. He's been thinking and talking and fighting this out. And then remember this, remember Casper, remember Casper, we're getting back to him. So in the Miller text, if you want to buy the thing online and you want to skip right to the, the meat, Chapter 8. Start with Chapter 8. It's called Contemporary Catholic Views on Papal Primacy. Um, excuse me, this is a typo. Yure Divino. That was an autocorrect there. Sorry. Um, the, and it op Okay, Chapter 8 opens with a quote from Walter Casper. And that quote is, The present crisis of the papacy is one of legitimation. Excuse me? The present crisis of the papacy is one of legitimation, meaning the papacy is not legitimate, and that's why it's in crisis. This is taken for granted by these people. A crisis of legitimation. Those are the words of Walter Casper, published in a journal, a, a collection of essays called, forgive me Germans if I, if I mangle this, Dienst an der Einheit on page 83. And there it is. Oh, let's look at this. There's a nice cover of Dienst an der Einheit. And here are the names of all the contributors, men who have contributed essays to this. And there's W. Casper right there. And oh, look, Joseph Ratzinger has contributed an essay as well. But look up here at the top. Look, Joseph Ratzinger's name is up above the title. What does that mean? That means Joseph Ratzinger edited this. He's the editor of it. And so as we just saw, Casper has published in this journal that Ratzinger has edited this quote, the present crisis of the papacy is one of legitimation. Don't tell me that Joseph Ratzinger was living in some bubble and had absolutely no idea what any of these guys were talking about. He was fighting it out with them. Walter Casper. Oh, let's let's look at a quote from um, Killian McDonald. This is from a paper written by Killian McDonald in 2002. It's a 19-page paper. It again, it's online. We and we've got links to that. The paper is called Walter Casper on the Theology and Praxis, Praxis of the Bishop's Office. Hmm, might be something interesting there, huh? All right. Now quoting McDonald, Casper does not enter into the long discussion, pre-conciliar, conciliar, and post-conciliar on the importance of involving bishops in the governance of the universal church, but the discussion is both an inner Catholic question and an ecumenical imperative. In his encyclical, Ut Unum Sint, number, ni number 96, JP2 issued a call for practical suggestions on how the Petrine ministry might be exercised. Quote, such a dialogue, Casper suggests, would make sense only if it led to a new historical formation of the office of Peter. Continuing on with McDonald, a new form would be similar to that which the office of Peter had in the first thousand years, but in a form appropriate to the differences in historical periods and the relationships of the various churches. This appears to point to an exercise of the Petrine function, which is more participatory in style, involving the bishops of the world. Casper could call in a number of historical studies to support the contention that the Petrine office has historically experienced a number of epical transformations, and none of its historical forms is identical with the office 
including the one that obtains today. Continuing with McDonald, one must indeed say that in the present form of its exercise, the Petrine ministry has far from completely exhausted its ecumenical possibilities. That's sinister. In any new form, the essential nature of the Petrine office would have to remain unchanged, but the call for a new form needs to be understood in reference to Casper's reading of the development of Catholic ecclesiology read through the eyes of Vatican I and II. He is obviously convinced that the Catholic sense of the Church demands a strong, even vigorous papacy. Any new form issuing from Pope John Paul II's call for help in rethinking the Petrine ministry would not mean a diminished Petrine role, but on the contrary, as he said in a different context, an even bigger role. The new expression of the Petrine office would include a significant role for the whole episcopacy in the governance of the church. Doesn't that sound exactly like what they've done? They have this hyper-aggressive, um, you know, you've got Bergoglio out front, but then you've got all of this hyper-aggressive activity going on. This is basically, this is confirming, this is Casper living out his fantasy. This is his entire life's project of doing that. Um, and note also, as we went through this, this text from McDonald, how office, ministry, and function are all being used distinctively. They're not being used interchangeably. Now here's Miller chapter 8, pages 194 and 195. This is just mind-blowing. Although in dealing with the origins of the papacy, contemporary theologians emphasize the close, re the close relation between jus divinum and jus humanum, when considering the permanence of the papacy, they stress rather the, the distinction between the changeable and immutable elements. This distinction within papal primacy as an institution is often formulated in terms of relation between a central unchangeable nucleus and its realization in changeable and historical forms. Theological, exegetical, and historical studies all make use of a similar distinction in explaining why a revision in the exercise of primatial authority is possible. Continuing on. Another way of making the same point is to distinguish between the Petrine ministry or function and the papacy. Let me say that again. Another way of making the same point is to distinguish between the Petrine ministry or function and the papacy, meaning the office. A sign and instrument of unity is needed for the government, for the government of the church. This task corresponds to what is also called the nucleus of the papacy. For these theologians, the papacy has been and is the historical realization of the Petrine ministry. The two realities are, however, conceptually distinct. Pope Benedict resigned the ministry. He did not resign the office. Now, this is interesting. Here comes the footnote off of this. So footnote number 98 on page 195, I believe. Burns, Communion Councils and Collegiality, page 172. Oh, Casper. Casper in Ministero Petrino, which is Italian for Petrine Ministry, page 56. Contrast the essenza, you can clearly see what that English word is, essence, of an institution, namely the Petrine office, with una ben determinata forma della sua realizzazione, in English, a well-determined form of its realization. Citing Mac this McDonald paper, Papal Primacy 185-186, Teals in um, Primate Pontificale 171 distinguishes between fond and form, Rahner, okay, here's Rahner, who, remember, is Ratzinger's mentor, who we eventually fell out with. Rahner's terminology varies, but he certainly holds that although the papacy is Jure Divino, this does not exclude the possibility that in the future, the papacy, while retaining its basic generic form, will be able to present quite a different image, if we may so express it, 
from that which we have hitherto been accustomed. Dun, dun, dun. Let's now look at Ratzinger. Ratzinger, in his 1996 book, Salt of the Earth, which the format of the book Salt of the Earth is basically an interview. It's a question and answer with Peter Seewald. So in Salt of the Earth, this is Ratzinger in 1996, Seewald's question is, do you think the papacy will remain as it is? Ratzinger responds, in its core, it will remain. In other words, a man is needed to be the successor of Peter and to bear a personal final authority that is supported collegially. Part of Christianity is a personalistic principle. It doesn't get vaporized into anonymities, but presents itself in the person of the priest, the bishop, and the unity of the universal church once again has a personal expression. This will remain the magisterial responsibility for the unity of the church, her faith, and her morals that was defined by Vatican I and II. Continued. Forms of exercise can change. They will certainly change when hitherto separated communities enter into unity with the Pope. Implying, read between the lines, Lutherans, Anglicans. By the way, the present Pope, JP2, because this is 1996, the present Pope's exercise of the pontificate with the trips around the world is completely different from that of Pius XII. What concrete variations emerge, I neither can nor want to imagine. What, what an incredibly ominous thing to say. What concrete variations emerge, I neither can nor want to imagine. We can't foresee now exactly how that will look. Don't tell me, don't tell me that this whole business was not in Ratzinger's mind. It's been in his mind for decades. He knew this was all swirling. He knew uh, Casper, he'd been fighting with him for decades. Here's the buzzword, demythologize. It's all about demythologizing the papacy. That is remove all supernatural and monarchical character from the papacy. This is the agenda of the Freemasons. This is the agenda of Casper. This is the agenda of Satan. Dissolve the Petrine office, empty it of all supernatural grace. New buzzwords, democratize, collegial, synodal, expanded, functional, revolution, kenosis and kenotic papacy kenosis and kenotic that um, that means emptying emptied okay lutheran concept of papacy emptied and devoid of potency this this is lutheranism this is the lutheran model this is what the lutherans would tolerate in terms of the papacy this comes from bultmann which comes from kant which comes from spinoza why be, why do they want to do this? Why this project of demythologizing the papacy? Because the anti-church will need to have all of the external appearances of the true church, but will be totally devoid of grace. So you have to have a thing that looks like the papacy, but does not have any of the grace of state, does not have a supernatural protection. It is, it is devoid, of all, uh, uh, devoid of all grace. The papacy has to be destroyed, according to them, but the appearance remain in order to deceive even the elect into following an anti-pope into the anti-church. And don't you see that that's exactly what's going on? Precisely. This is the Casparian Freemasonic agenda in a nutshell. And ultimately, it's the Satanic agenda. Now let's go to Gans Wine's speech again. Um, I don't think I covered this part of his speech in my part one. All right, here we go. The momentous resignation of the theologian Pope represented a step forward primarily by the fact that on February 11, 2013, speaking in Latin in front of the surprise cardinals, he introduced into the Catholic Church the new institution of Pope Emeritus. New institution. Well, we've got people screaming and yelling, saying, oh, no, it's no big deal. Emeritus just means, you know, like Bishop Emeritus, like Professor Emeritus, it's no big deal. Well, no, that's not what Ganswine said at his address at the Gregorianum on the 20th of May, 2016. He said, 
he introduced into the Catholic Church the new institution of Pope Emeritus. There's never been a Pope Emeritus before. before. Popes have resigned before, but there's never been a Pope Emeritus before. So what does that mean? Think logically. Think logically. Stating that his strength was no longer sufficient to properly exercise the Petrine ministry. The key word in that statement is munus Petrinum, translated as happens most of the time with Petrine ministry. And yet munus in Latin has a multiplicity of meanings. This is Gamswine speaking. It can mean service, duty, guide, or gift, even prodigy. It's office. Before and after his resignation, Benedict understood and understands his task as a participation in such a Petrine ministry. He has left the papal throne, and yet with the step made on February 11, 2013, he has not at all abandoned this ministry. Instead, he has complemented the personal office with a collegial and synodal dimension as a quasi-shared ministry. This is Ganswine, and again, repeating what I said in the part one and I've written about. I was told by people in the Ratzinger academic circle in Rome that this, this speech was given to Pope Benedict before he delivered it, that Pope Benedict read it, handed it back to him, and said, complimenti, he, that, that Pope Benedict approved this speech before it was delivered. That's what I was told. It was the least expected step in contemporary Catholicism, regularly writes, and yet a possibility, papal retirement, which Cardinal Ratzinger had already pondered publicly on August 10, 1978 in Munich in a homily on the occasion of the death of Paul VI. 35 years later, he has not abandoned the office of Peter. I'm sorry, how much clearer does it get? He has not abandoned the office of Peter, something which would have been entirely impossible for him after his irrevocable acceptance of the office in April 2005. What part of has not abandoned the office and irrevocable? He believes that his acceptance of the Petrine office was irrevocable. By an act of extraordinary courage, he has instead renewed this office, even against the opinion of well-meaning and undoubtedly competent advisors, Cardinal Brandmuller first among them, and with a final effort, he has strengthened it, as I hope. Of course, only history will prove this, but in the history of the church, it shall remain true that in the year 2013, the famous theologian on the throne of Peter became history's first Pope Emeritus. Since then, his role, allow me to repeat it once again, is entirely different from that, for example, of the Holy Pope Celestine V, who after his resignation in 1294 would have liked to return to being a hermit, becoming instead a prisoner of his successor Boniface VIII, to whom today in the church we owe the establishment of Jubilee years. To date, in fact, there has never been a step like that taken by Benedict XVI. So it is not surprising that it has been seen by some as revolutionary or to the contrary is entirely consistent with the gospel while still others see the papacy in this way secularized ah, and as never before and thus more collegial and functional or even simply more human and less sacred. And still others are of the opinion that Benedict XVI with this step has almost speaking in theological and historical critical terms, demythologized the papacy. Don't know how much clearer it gets. And I too, a firsthand witness of the spectacular and unexpected step of Benedict XVI, I must admit that what always comes to mind is the well-known and brilliant axiom with which in the Middle Ages, John Duns Scotus justified the divine decree for the immaculate conception of the mother of God, decuit potuit fecit. Because remember, remember when you quit your job that time and you know, you just quit your job like everyone else quits their job and everybody analogized it to it, analogized it to the immaculate conception The Immaculate Conception. 
No, he, he just totally resigned like every other pope resigned that had resigned before. Except it, it was like the Immaculate Conception. That is to say, it was fitting because it was reasonable. God could do it, therefore he did it, meaning the Immaculate Conception. I apply the axiom to the decision to resign in the following way. It was fitting because Benedict XVI was aware that he lacked the necessary strength for the extremely onerous office. He could do it because he had already thoroughly thought through, from a theological point of view, the possibility of Pope's emeritus for the future. So he did it. Two key points here. Number one, dissolving the office in favor of a transformed, evolved, expanded, collegial, synodal, Petrine ministry has been the Freemasonic Teutonic agenda for 100 plus years to topple the papacy and the institutional church. The agenda of Freemasonry is to destroy the Catholic church. And to destroy the Catholic church, you have to destroy the papacy. Point number two, relinquishing governance without abdicating the office is exactly what blessed Emperor Charles I Habsburg did under Freemasonic coercion in November of 1918. And there's blessed Charles right there. Here's Pope Leo XIII on Freemasonry uh, in his document Humanus Genus from 1884. This is paragraph 15. But against the Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff, the contention of these enemies has been for a long time directed, meaning Freemasons. The Pontiff was first, for specious reasons, thrust out from the bulwark of his liberty and of his right, the civil princedom. Soon he was unjustly driven into a condition which was unbearable because of the difficulties raised on all sides. And now the time has come when the partisans of the sects openly declare what in secret among themselves they have for a long time plotted, that the sacred power of the pontiffs must be abolished and that the papacy itself, founded by divine right, must be utterly destroyed. If other proofs were wanting, this fact would be sufficiently disclosed by the testimony of men well informed, of whom some at other times and others again recently have declared it to be true of the Freemasons that they especially desire to assail the church with irreconcilable hostility and that they will never rest until they have destroyed whatever the Supreme Pontiffs have established for the sake of religion. Tell me that this is not 100% true and we're living it right now. Vatican News, 15 January, 2019. Quote, a difficult task. For, this, is, this is Bergoglio. This is quoting anti-Pope Bergoglio by Vatican News. A difficult task for the church in response. The Pope, sick, anti-Pope, said, the church is called to react against the negativity that foments division, indifference, and hostility. This is a difficult task for the church which is in danger of failing to recognize the gravity of the contemporary emergency. It's time, he, anti-Pope Bergoglio said, for a new vision aimed at promoting a humanism of fraternity. Humanism of fraternity. That is the name of Freemasonry. Humanism of fraternity. That is its name and solidarity between individuals and peoples, also known as one world religion, one world government. Emperor, going back to Charles I Habsburg, Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany warned the Archbishop of Cologne, Cardinal Felix von Hartmann of the Freemasonic war plan and Hartmann wrote a letter on November 8th, 1918 to the Apostolic Nuncio, the Vatican ambassador, to Germany, who was, at the time, Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli, who was to become Pope Pius XII in March of 1939. The letter opened thusly, Your Excellency, His Majesty the Emperor just has let it be known to me that according to news that came to him yesterday, the Grand Orient, Freemasonic Lodge, has just decided first to depose all sovereigns, all monarchs, first of all him the emperor, then to destroy the Catholic Church, to imprison the Pope, etc., and finally to establish on the ruins of the former bourgeois society 
a world republic under the leadership of American big capital. Yep. Yeah, this, this was written in November of 1918. Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany abdicated the next day, the 9th of November, 1918. And Emperor Charles I of Austria, listen to this, renounced participation in state affairs two days after that on the 11th of November. Blessed Charles I, though, did not abdicate and went to his dying breath saying, I did not abdicate. I am still the emperor. All I did was renounce participation in state affairs. Does that sound familiar? Do you think that Joseph Ratzinger, Bavarian, isn't aware of this history? You think he doesn't know anything about that? Huh. Boy, it's got a familiar ring to it, doesn't it? And also under Freemasonic coercion. Why? What does Casper want? Casper wants money and power, but money is a big part of it. The German Kirchensteuer tax revenue from the German Lutheran churches would effectively nearly double annual revenues if Casper could organize somehow getting a legal proclamation that the Lutherans were somehow reunited with, with Rome. And in order to do this, you have to destroy the papacy. So that's, this has been the project all along. They want those, the German church tax revenues, billions of dollars per year, billions. The only way to get any sort of Lutheran reunification is to eliminate the papacy. Freemasonry and Satan share Casper's goals. That's it in a nutshell. Like follow the money, as they say. So what probably happened? Okay, Cardinal Carlo Martini, head of the St. Gallen Mafia, you've all by now heard of this St. Gallen Mafia, this group of cardinals who are mostly sodomites, several of them are, are child abusers, so on and so forth. They form this little clique and they're meeting together and they've been, you know, organizing about how they're going to get control of Rome, overthrow the papacy, et cetera, et cetera. The head of this group was Cardinal Carlo Martini, who I believe was in Milan. He dies on the 31st of August, 2012. Who then becomes the de facto leader of this St. Gallen Mafia clique? Walter Casper. Casper springs into action, it seems to me, with Martini dead. Casper's now calling the shots. Casper, Joseph Ratzinger's lifelong enemy, coerced, probably threatened a pliable and despairing Pope Benedict into resigning in order to install the St. Gallen puppet Bergoglio and drive toward a Lutheran reunification and Freemasonic world order. We know, I chose the word despairing very specifically. If you read the book that that French sodomite, uh, what's his name, Frederick Martel, I believe, wrote, what he describes, and about the only thing in that book that seems even remotely credible, is he describes when a Pope Benedict, I believe, went to Cuba and realized, was presented with data that showed him that the sodomite infiltration in Cuba was near total. And then, you know, Pope, Pope Ratzinger knew that it was bad in Rome. Um, I think he came to a point and then he received the 300 page dossier that was famously presented to him in December of 2012. And I think despairing is exactly the word. I think that he, he just looked around and realized that he was almost completely surrounded by sodomites. And despairing um, was, was susceptible to this. The other thing that I think is that what, what the mode of coercion, what they're exactly saying to Pope Benedict is basically this. Either you let us schism the church or we will schism the church. 
They, basi they basically got him in check. This is the satanic setup of the chessboard. Either you let us schism the church or we will schism the church. And the only way you can fight back against that is to go on hyper-aggressive offense. You can't play defense against that sort of a thing. You have to go on the offense. But Ratzinger, not known for hyper-aggressive offense, let's put it that way. So Ratzinger proffered a substantially erroneous and thus invalid resignation. Whether Pope Ratzinger believes his attempted partial abdication to be valid or not is not germane. I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Whether he believes his attempted partial abdication to be valid or not is, is just simply not germane. Pope Benedict's motives, while interesting, are not determinative. History will bear all this out. We'll all find out at the general judgment exactly what happened, but right now in real time, his motives aren't what's important. All that matters is the law. Only the law matters. Why does this question matter at all? Why not just wait for Bergoglio to die? One, because the truth matters. Only the truth will set us free. Effeminacy, sloth, and acedia are vices. And that's, that's what this whole, that's what we're mired in. Acedia, effeminacy, and sloth. Don't want to do anything, don't want to rock the boat. It would be difficult, it would be hard. It might reduce my own personal pleasure, income, style of life, prestige, career, whatever. And acedia is the vice of just not caring. There's a lot of them that just don't care. And they don't care that they don't care. You're seeing a lot of that now among trads too. I'm bored with this, I'm bored. They're declaring they don't care and they don't care that they don't care. In fact, they even hold it out as, as some sort of a, a false virtue. Number two, souls are being scandalized. The false premise of Bergoglio ever having been the Pope leads to false sedificantism. One of the, as we talked about in the first video, um, one of the insults and, and uh, calumnies or, or slanders that, it, that is hurled at me and people who hold this position is that we are sedificantists. What, what are you talking about? The entire basis of the argument is that the see isn't vacant and hasn't been vacant since April of 2005. This is a species of projection. Why? Because if you accept that Francis is Pope, anti-Pope Bergoglio is Pope, or ever has been, okay, it's now... It's not even debatable. We don't need to go down any discussion rabbit hole of whether or not Bergoglio is a heretic. Of course he is. He's an arch heretic. I don't even think you could, you could honestly say that the man is Catholic. Okay, if you accept, if you're operating on the false base premise that Bergoglio is the Pope, it is now absolutely clear and undeniable that he is an arch heretic. So now people are starting to peel off and say, well, he's lost his office. If he's lost his office and you take that, that Ratzinger's attempted abdication in 2013 was valid, where does that leave you? It leaves you with a vacant C. So you see, it's the heir of Francis being the Pope that leads to sedificantism, and it's already started. Jonathan Byrd, um, a blogger, has come out and said, and fully embraced not just sedificantism, sedificantism in, in this time right now in real time, he's become a full-blown 1958 sedificantist. And there's another one. Who is the other one? Robert Spencer or something like that. I, I, I'd have to look it up. There's going to be more of these because it's, it's logical. If, but you're starting from the false base premise that Bergoglio is the Pope. He's clearly a heretic. Therefore, he's lost his office. Therefore, the see is vacant. You're going to see a lot more of this. No. If you want to stay away from the error of false sedificantism, you have to go back to the truth. It's Benedict is the Pope and has been all along. The see has not been vacant since the interregnum of, of April 2005. That's the last time the see was vacant. You've got to start from that, that true base premise, and that, that keeps you from falling into the air of sedificantism. You say, well, what happens when, when if, if and when Pope Benedict dies? Well, then, yeah, the see will be vacant because the Pope will have died and there won't be anybody there. 
we got to get this right. We have to get this right. Bergoglio, he's losing his, his usefulness and he's become, he's become a pariah. Now the secular media is starting to hate him with all of this sex abuse stuff. It's clear that he's protecting pedophiles. It's clear that he's, he's a homosexualist. He's, he's a friend of sodomites, if not a sodomite himself. And, you know, that trash all flocks together. So you do the math. Um, he is losing his, his um, appeal in the secular media, in the secular world. Okay, what happens if Pietro Perelin, who's the Secretary of State, and Walter Casper go to anti-Pope Bergoglio and say, you're done, resign? Okay, now if you're operating from the false race premise that he was the Pope and he resigns, what is, what's going to happen? they're going to call another invalid conclave and you're going to get another anti-pope. You're going to get anti-pope Perelin or worse, anti-pope Tagle, that Filipino creature who's, who's in his early 60s, dumb as a brick, would be completely, would be completely the tool of, of this group. We've got to get this right. You can't be calling more false conclaves. We've got to get this right. And people are falling into sedvacantism and falling into apostasy. Number three, the standard of schism is union with the Roman pontiff. So yeah, that's why this is also quite important. Canon 751, schism is a withdrawal of submission to the supreme pontiff or from communion with the members of the church subject to him. A person cannot both submit to Bergoglio's heresies and be Catholic. So you're just, you're, you just keep running into these terrible, terrible walls. The only thing that's freeing, the only thing that makes sense, that has logical progression and keeps everything intact with integrity and cohesion is the truth. Pope Benedict is the one and only living Pope and has been since April of 2005. The satanic chessboard, like I said, is this. Either you let me schism the church or I will schism the church. The only response to this is going on aggressive offense, aggressive offense. And that means declaring the truth about anti-Pope Bergoglio and Pope Benedict still reigning. What can be expected from going on offense and confronting the Bergoglian anti-papacy? Ridicule, ostracism, defamation and calumny, loss of faculties, suppression, excommunication, um, physical assault, and maybe even eventually death. I put the asterisk um, next to loss of faculties, suppression, and excommunication. Remember, Bergoglio has no real authority. Therefore, these actions would be null and void. But they would absolutely have uh, consequences in real life, obviously. Uh, but, but in reality, the truth would be Bergoglio has no real authority. So all these actions would be illegitimate. Yeah, you're still going to have, you st suffer the consequences of them, but they're not just, they're not real. In short, expect the grace and favor of the cross of Christ. Act and God will act, as St. Joan of Arc famously said. Final thoughts on the visibility of the church, the visibility of the, of the church, the motif of eclipse, the church in eclipse, and, and on humility. Um, the church is visible and the church is visible at her earthly head, period, full stop. If anybody is confused, going the wrong way, can't see what's, what's going on, the problem is not with the church, with God, with the papacy, qua papacy. All of those things are stable. The problem is with us, is with our blindness. The analogy I use is that if if Ray Charles, blind as a bat, is standing on the Las Vegas Strip at 1030 at night and the thing's lit up from one end to the other and Ray can't see it, it doesn't mean that the Las Vegas Strip is invisible. All it means is that Ray Charles is blind. That's exactly what's going on here. The, question, the, the issue is not, is the church visible? Oh, the church is visible. The question is, can we see it? And this isn't Rex Matrimism. This is, this is a testimony to the visibility of the church and God keeping his promises. 
Um, in terms of the, the, the motif of eclipse, people are saying, well, you know, the church is going to go into eclipse, implying that the church going into eclipse would make it invisible. I think the church is an eclipse now. We're, we're, to, we're darn near totality, it seems to me, right now. Think about an eclipse. Eclipses are, by definition, highly visible events. They're events where people are standing and staring slack-jawed up into the sky, pointing at this incredible event where something is passing in front of something else, and the, the, the eclipse itself is awesome and fearful to behold. I think, I think the church is an eclipse right now. Protestants, completely secular people, are staring at what's going on in Rome, slack-jawed, pointing, saying, what in the world is going on? Even people who aren't even Catholic or who, who hate the church, every time anti-Pope Bergoglio opens his mouth, people are just looking at this going, what in the world? Don't think that the church going into eclipse is going to render it invisible. If anything, it renders it more visible. When was the church ever in the headlines as much as it is today? It's precisely because it's in eclipse. It's not invisible and it's never going to be invisible because that would be God breaking his promise. It's always there. The question is, can we see it? And finally, humility. Um, true humility, people are arguing, well, you know, Bergoglio, Pope Francis just proves that we've all been wrong about the papacy for these 2,000 years. We've been treating this guy as an absolute monarch, and we've been going off all these assumptions of infallibility, and maybe Vatican I was wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's clear that we've just all been completely wrong about the papacy. Really? All of the saints, all of the doctors of the church, everybody, everyone was wrong about the papacy up until, lo and behold, six years ago. And now, thank God that we have these bloggers who might have a bachelor's degree in theology from some, let's face it, not exactly rigorous university to explain how Everyone before was all wrong about the papacy, and only now do we understand that eh, it's not really as important as we thought it was, because look, Pope Francis proves that. <sighs> the lack of humility there is just stunning to me, absolutely stunning. If you want to be humble, look back at the 2,000 years and say, what would the saints have all said about this? What would the doctors of the church said about this? What did they say about the papacy themselves in their own day? They weren't wrong. They weren't wrong. This is the disordered culture, clearly. Be humble. First joyful mystery, the Annunciation. Fruit of the mystery, humility. So, in conclusion, um, the Matthew 17, 20 initiative continues apace. That is full fasting twice a week, if you can, whatever you can do. The intention is that anti-Pope Bergoglio be um, acknowledged as anti-Pope and removed and the whole thing be nullified. That Pope Benedict Ratzinger be acknowledged as having been the one and only living Pope since April 2005. That Bergoglio repent, revert to Catholicism, die in a state of grace, and achieve the beatific vision. And that Pope Ratzinger repent of whatever he might need to repent of, die in a state of grace, and achieve the beatific vision. Keep praying. Things are happening. Things are happening. Don't despair. Pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena. St. Vincent Ferrer. St. Vincent Ferrer temporarily backed an anti-pope, so he is very solicitous for all of us to be right on this. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who fixed a, a situation where there was an uncontested anti-pope for eight years. St. Peter Damien, who fought the Sodomites. Blessed Charles, Blessed Emperor Charles, and his wife Zita, who is servant of God, um, who, who lived this, who lived through this, this, this Freemasonic attack on his person as a monarch, with the next step, obviously, with the eyes being on Rome and the papacy. St. Joseph, 
patron of the Universal Church, Our Lady Undoer of Knots, what a knot this is. Pray for us, pray for the papacy, pray for Pope Benedict XVI. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.